All right, I think we're live. So welcome everybody to our back to Zoom meeting. Uh, this will only be uh, temporary. Um, we, there was just a uh, prior commitment at the Bowen this month. So we couldn't come up with another date. So we figured this was the best thing. So we'll be back at the uh, Bowen uh, next month and should be there the rest of the year. There may be a conflict in October. And so we'll see if we can find another date rather than going on Zoom, but at least we have this as an option. So I hope everybody's uh, doing well, ready for a uh, beautiful weekend, lots of uh, photography plans. And we've got uh, Stanley Leary here. He's our speaker tonight. And we'll go ahead and get started. Let's see here. Let me start the slideshow, maybe. There we go. Unlock his so mic. What? Unlock his mic. <laughs> Who's the, oh, Stanley can, can undo his mic himself. Right. Yeah. So. Welcome to the April meeting. Got a lot to talk about tonight. We're gonna to do some club business. We have some events and workshops to talk about. Uh, Stanley Leary is gonna be doing his uh, presentation. And then we have our uh, photo challenge. The theme was uh, macro close up. So as usual, um, if you're not a paid member, you can become a paid member, it's $20. Uh, per individual or $30 per family per year. Uh, lots of benefits. Um, you can go to our website to see what those uh, benefits are. Uh, but one of the things we wanted to spotlight this month is our free mentorship, mentorship program. So I'm gonna let Lisa talk about that real quick. Sure, um, for any of you new members, um, if you haven't ventured onto the club's website yet, um, there's a section on the website for uh, paid members. And within that paid member section, um, we have information on our mentorship program, uh, which is basically where about 15 of our more experienced photographers in the club um, volunteer to offer um, their experience um, and their guidance uh, as, a as a mentor um, on a one-on-one -on -one type of basis. Um, and you'll find on the website, we have a big grid of different topics that you can um, look for a mentor under. So you can get help in uh, all kinds of different areas of photography um, and more information on how to contact a mentor and what is involved in that program is on the website. So check it out if you haven't seen it yet. Oh, let me put in a plug also, if I have a minute, Mike, for in Inman Park. Um, oh, yeah, we haven't talked about that lately. <laughs> uh, Inman Park is uh, the coffee shop in um, Gainesville, um, where the, the club um, manages the art display on the walls. Um, and we have uh, one month this year, July, uh, where we have uh, one photographer signed up already, but... Um, she would like to share the show with somebody else. So if anybody is interested in sharing the show in July of this year, uh, get in touch with me. Um, and then also I have some dates open in 2023 uh, for full months. If you're interested in, in showing your work at Inman Perk, um, either on your own or with someone else for a month, uh, get in touch with me. Thank you. All right, and you can just message Lisa on uh, Facebook, or if you don't know how to get in touch with her, message me, and I'll get you in touch with, uh, with Lisa. All right, coming up uh, next weekend, North Georgia Camera Club Council Shootout. We've talked about this before. Uh, we have 14 members on our team. I think there are 10 clubs that are uh, participating. Um, if you did not sign up to be on our team but are still interested in um, participating, contact me by Monday just to let me know 
we're going to have a Zoom meeting for the team members on Tuesday. That's why I need you to contact me on Monday. Uh, they will allow us to uh, register people the day of the event, but they needed the early entry so they knew how big a room to give um, each club. So if you're interested in that, uh, let me know. And otherwise, we've got 14 people participating next Saturday. So that should be fun. All right, we've got a couple of trips coming up. Uh, Rick's going to talk about um, waterfalls with Barry Trails trip towards the end of the month. Hey, everybody. So what I wanted to do, and I've been wanting to do it, is just do a waterfall trip in some of our gorgeous uh, North Georgia waterfall trails, where they're sort of lined by mountain laurel and rhododendron, and try to catch it when one or both of those things are blooming. So for now, it's sort of a tentative date, and I'll get it firmed up pretty soon, and I'll get it announced properly. But I, I'm looking at probably Saturday, May 21st, with a uh, sort of a rollover date of the 28th. If either weather fails us or we find out that, um, uh, that if waiting another week would make a big difference on the color of those flowers. So we just got to play it a little bit closer to the time to, to be sure. Um, I will say just one footnote on it. I'm looking at doing Panther and Angel Falls and then Minnehaha, which is right around the corner from those first two. Um, both really nice trails, really pretty, and a lot of these flowers should be, you know, should be along there. There's not a ton of parking, so we're probably going to try to work on carpooling a little bit if, um, if there's a decent response. And that's it. Yeah, and just watch for details on that. And uh, then we'll have our we do this just about every year, the Helen to the Atlantic balloon race. I'll let Dick talk. Okay. Yeah. The, so the <clears throat> balloon race is held uh, Thursday through Saturday of the first, well, uh, of the first Saturday in June, <clears throat> the end of the first week in June, uh, weather permitting. And that means both uh, needs to be not rainy and the wind needs to be blowing the right direction. Um, but even if the wind is not blowing so they can launch, they still generally inflate the balloons and will raise them up 50 feet in the air or something tethered. So there's plenty of opportunity for photography either way. Um, the venue is, and I'll post the uh, website for this on Facebook, is a big privately owned field in Helen, Georgia, but they allow everybody in for the event at, uh, although I think last year they started charging five bucks a car, if I remember right, um, used to be free. The thing starts at seven in the morning, so you're going to have to get up early or find a hotel room. Uh, but I always found it is great fun. Um, and some people will, after that, then go up to Anna Ruby Falls or Unicoi Park or something to try to find some other photography opportunities. It's all good. You now I should comment on Rick's thing. I was at Cloudland Canyon this week, and the wildflowers in Sitton Gulch are just prolific. If you happen to live out that way, it is worth the trip. You're back to you, Mike. All right, and that's trip-wise, that's all we have planned now. Um, we actually, I was thinking about this earlier today, we need to start working on our club picnic. We haven't done that in two years, and so that's something we're going to want to probably do uh, maybe in June before it gets really, really hot. Uh, but yeah, we're definitely planning on doing um, the picnic this year. Um, I don't know if Timmy's on tonight. I know she had a school function. She's a, uh, she's a teacher, so there's lots of times she has functions on Friday. Are you here, Timmy? I'm going to take that as a no. So I'll talk a little bit about workshops. She has more information than I do, but we've got two uh, workshops coming up. Uh, we've got uh, Scott Gibson doing a workshop on uh, portrait photography on May 22nd. Uh, that's a Sunday. He did one last year. Uh, due to time and space, he's limiting it to six people. 
And we're gonna have to charge $30 per person for that. And that's to pay for the model. Uh, we're, um, he sent us a link so that people will be able to pay him directly. So the club's not gonna be involved with any of the money. Uh, we will probably post that link that first week of May, around, around May 1st. Um, don't know what time yet. My plan is to post the link and send an email to the uh, paid members at the same time. And it's gonna become first come first serve. And as soon as uh, Scott fills up, that's gonna be it. He's unfortunately, we could only do six people. And I think he said it was gonna be for four hours, like maybe from 12 to four, but we'll get all that information. And then we tentatively have Anna DeStefano uh, to do a workshop on June 16th. That one will probably be online because that is a uh, Thursday. That's actually the night before our June meeting. I don't know what she's going to be teaching, uh, but that's what uh, Timmy is working on. So we're definitely trying to stay an active club with lots of events and workshops and learning opportunities. We don't want anybody to ever be bored. And so, yeah, we will go to our presentation. Um, let me do a little um, biography here of Stanley. And then Stanley, I'll let you go ahead and share your screen. Uh, hang on here. Stanley Leary's photography helps companies tell their own stories and build their brand. Some of his clients include Chick-fil-A, Newell Rubbermaid, Coke, Georgia Tech, and the Carter Center. His work has taken him across the United States and beyond to uh, Chile, Peru, Canada, France, Ghana, Guatemala, Haiti, Honduras, Mexico, Nicaragua, Portugal, and Romania. Stanley is also a teacher and has been a guest lecturer at the uh, World, World Journalism Institute in Washington, DC, the Southwestern Photojournalist Conference in Fort Worth, Texas, the Art Institute of Atlanta, the American Society of Media Photographers, and the uh, Southeastern Photographer photographic society. And so Stanley's going to talk about learning to write with lights. So give me a minute here. Let me stop sharing. All right, and you should be able to share your screen, Stanley. Okay. I'll go for, let's see. It's giving me an error message to see if this is working. Whoops, all of a sudden my error. Um, um, on here. Let me make sure I have it okay to share. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. All of a sudden, it has never done this before. I always had it. Let me rejoin you. All of a sudden, it's making forcing me out and making me come back. Give me one second. As I said, we never know what technical issues we're going to have. I'm back. Can you guys hear me and see what I'm doing here? We can hear you and see you. Oh, good. So where I am right now, I just want to take you guys to a couple spots that I hope you have a chance to go visit. One is my website, which is my name, stanleyleary.com. How many people went to that uh, and looked at this uh, so far? Has anybody gone to it? Okay, so um, what I want to just give you some ideas. This is some of the topics and things because I've been doing it so long. There's separate galleries and the way it's designed is for clients when they search for somebody like corporate photography, they'll go straight to that page or headshots or other things. I also do video and um, I've been teaching workshops all over uh, the world on how to do storytelling using visuals. And uh, Another thing I have is my blog, which you can uh, link to right off my main website. And I post stories here. I've been doing this since 2006. So pretty much anything you want to search for, you can search over here, lighting off camera or whatever. I pretty probably covered it at some point here for you. And did this because when I was teaching students and workshops, people, a lot of people would like to kind of have something to reference. So. Uh, most, if you guys are like most of the people I know, it's kind of like 
uh, be quiet and start showing pictures. So what I'm gonna do is start showing some photos in the background to, and I'm just going to first kind of walk you, th this will just take a, a minute or two and gives you some of the ideas of some of the things I do. When I started out, I started as a, um, a newspaper photographer, went into magazine work, and pretty much for the first 10 years of my life, never really used flash at all, except for on my camera to light up the, to raise the room level. And that was starting in 82 until uh, pretty much until almost 93. I did do portraits with strobes using for um, group shots and things like that. But for 90% of the stuff, I was doing photojournalism. And today I still, my primary favorite thing to do is uh, documenting stories around the world. And I do a lot of stuff for missions type of work for church groups. Uh, and the first thing that's important is before you can write with light, you need to see light. And so this first part is just to give you an idea. All the first stuff here, none of this is lit. That's all just natural light. Um, well, the thing is, when I first started with film, you burned and dodged and did all this stuff to make your stuff work. And what I quickly found out was uh, you could get that all in camera and not burn and dodge in the dark room and just use lights to capture and do the exact same thing. And which was becoming more and more important uh, for clients going forward. So um, after I worked in newspapers and all that, and I did my master's degree, I then went off and I came to Atlanta in 93 working for Georgia Tech. And after that ended up doing as all different kinds of colleges and universities and everything else, working also for Associated Press and some other wire services. I do also, I, I, my range of stuff is pretty wide from here. This is like mixing flash and ambient light here uh, to kind of help out with the clients um, and uh, putting in grass and things like that for different shots. So these are just to give you some idea of some of the things I've been doing for the past few years. Then I picked up my drone and started learning that because clients, to me, it's like pulling out one extra lens in your bag. So if you've all had the 70 to 200 and you had the trifecta of 14 to 24, 24 to 70 and 7200, the one thing is you're still stuck on the ground where you can stand and having the drone gives you a whole new perspective. So I've been using that to help out clients. It makes a huge difference to help them. Since 2006, I was working with the Chick-fil-A family directly for, uh, and then in 2008, they brought me on to do a lot of their corporate work. So for 12 years, I was not just doing photography and video. I was the, uh, the main strategic consultant for the corporate communications team that once a week I sat down with director of communications and we'd have lunch and talk about all the meetings I went to and my advice for helping communicate to their operators and growing their brand. The good news is all the years I've been doing that, they've been growing by at least 12 to 13 to 15 percent every single year. Last year, they grew by four billion dollars in one year. Uh, so these pictures and stuff are to help the internal communications primarily. So been doing that uh, for a while, but also I continue to do other things. Uh, you know, everybody has to do the groundbreaking shot. So I just thought I'd show you some of that. And when I'm doing outside shots now, I'm using a lot of light and things to make things look better. It's a cool thing with doing Chick-fil-A. When you cover their annual meetings, you get to meet everybody. So, you know, Garth Brooks, Jeff Foxworthy, uh, you name the person. I've just pretty much that that's what happens after a while for covering different events for them. So, uh, but, uh, so the cool thing about most of this work and everything I've done up to now is you really get to know your client. And it's not about just knowing your photographer, how to work your camera and lights. It really is. You have to know the subject really well because my entire career has been based on telling expert stories better than they can tell their own. So when I was at Georgia Tech, researchers who knew 10 times more than I did about a subject, but I could communicate it better than they could visually in a story. And that's been my entire career and what people pay me to do. What I find is that many people, when it comes to camera clubs, everybody's interested in uh, photographing a lot of stuff that's not necessarily what professionals are shooting all the time for pay. So if you're interested and want to learn about lighting, how to tell stories, a good group of people that have, uh, I do private lessons as well, but a lot of stuff that I teach 
is how to do a uh, transition from just doing photos only to putting small videos together for things like a nonprofit or uh, other organizations that you're a part of or churches you want to cover their mission trips overseas. You'd like to come back and help them raise money rather than everybody just going, oh, those were nice pictures. And nobody gave money. Sports has been where I kind of started in college. So in 82, when I was at East Carolina, I, I was shooting for the school paper and all and through the years continue to shoot. A lot of this is now Chick-fil-A uh, type of stuff. So the pay there is probably 10 times that of what I'd made shooting for a newspaper because everything I'm using is for corporate, really almost for advertising to kind of show what they're doing. But the work has to be at that level or they can't use it. So uh, the more you grow in your photography, the difference between you taking pictures of weddings and portraits Pretty much all those people were in the room with you when they took the picture. So if you have a well-exposed picture, it looks nice. The people go, great, that reminds me of the trip. But there's a big difference between a wedding photographer who shoots pictures for the, the wedding and a different thing for a photographer who shoots pictures to make people feel like they wish they had been at that wedding. So that's a difference between going from personal photography to shooting for corporate and advertising. These are some photos I did at Georgia Tech. And the cool thing to know here and what I, why I want you to see this is everything I lit at Georgia Tech, it had never pretty much 90% of it had never been photographed before when it came to lasers and mixing of lights. And I'm going to stop here and go to one photo, to give you an example of what I'm saying. Uh, this is three different exposures. There's a laser, there's a monitor, and there's a flash. That's never been photographed ever before. I'm the first person to step in that room and do that. I was the first person to ever do this photo as well. This is a micro needle. It's the most famous photo of all of Georgia Tech. It's gone more places anywhere else. And uh, the doctor who invented this had just gone to the eye surgeon uh, and had his eyes dilated. That's why they're so big pupils. But anyway, that's like an F90 and trying to give people perspective of an ouchless needle, basically. So that gives you kind of an idea of some of the things I've done. So before I get into the next real thing here, which is going to be um, more about, um, let me get this set here, hold on. Uh, there, switch there, okay. So the next thing I want to kind of talk to you guys about, which I think is really important, is I think it's really important for everyone to realize if you're a photographer and you cannot manipulate the light, you're not really a photographer because that's what the that's what photography means, writing with light. Um, available light to me is anything I bring with me or is on location. This particular photo is me dreaming up the concept, me lighting it and executing it. This became a poster for Georgia Tech's um, elect, um, music department. They put on a performance where they were mixing computers with regular traditional uh, instruments. But how did I light this? So there's how I lit it. I put a gel on the background, the computer screen that was on him. We took the monitor out. Uh, put, uh, I mean, the tube in there and put uh, that on top of his head, put a gel inside, lit it up behind his head. Then I have a grid light on the uh, drum, that little star, and then another grid light on his face. And I'm going to just go through a few different photos here. And the whole purpose is to let you see the photo and then the lighting. So for those of you who are new to lighting, the one thing you want to be able to do is... Um, you want to be able to go out and wherever you are with outside and sunlight and somebody takes a picture, you should be able to analyze where the sun's coming from. Is it coming from behind them, over the side, wherever? Um, a lot of people don't realize why the golden hour is such a big deal. Most, uh, how many people realize that the reason the golden hour is wonderful is that's the, the angle of which you photograph people with lights. 45 degrees up a little bit higher, but not too high. So you can see it's the angle of light that hits a person. It makes it really great for lighting. So hopefully you guys have been looking at this a little. One of the tricks with most of the photos is looking in people's eyes and they're like a little glass and you can see where the lights are if you look close. So in this one, 
I had lights off to the side to kind of light the people in front and a little bit spilling over to get the background. And then the lights in front are lighting the guy in the very front. That's probably one of the more famous football players at George Tech. That was Calvin Johnson, who went first draft in the pick. But that was him being featured. And that was on all the buses around campus, on billboards and everything for a long time when he was there. Now, this is really uh, mixing light is what I call this, is where you're, you go for the exposure of the um, surrounding area, take a, your picture, get a good exposure, and then you underexpose by about a stop. Then you take the, the light that you're putting on their faces and you raise it by one stop. So their face is underexposed by one stop without the flash. Then you overexpose by one stop and then the two of those give you a proper exposure on the person where the light's landing, but everywhere where the lights that you're using don't land is being lit by the available light, and that's underexposed a little. And this is in Hawaii. Some of my friends, I go out there and teach every year how to do lighting. So this is a basic thing. I did this with little tiny speed flashes, a little, real simple. This is um, me showing up at uh, Bernal College and the person says, we'd like you to do dancing stuff. We didn't have any preparation. That I just walked in and says, can you do something creative? And so in 15 minutes, I'm coming up with this kind of stuff to kind of create some lighting situations that created something for the dancers and uh, to kind of look like you're backstage. And those are the lighting setups, the brick wall, the two people there a grid on each of the people and then the gels in the background with the amber light if you're um, kind of helping there. Is this helpful for people so far? Okay. Yes, very. Thank you. So if anybody has a question, Barry, be sure you jump in and, uh, and stop me. Um, so in this one, it's a very similar setup. All I did was kind of, rather than moving all lights around a whole bunch, just slid those over, kept the amber light where it was, and ran a grid on her, and then shot it again. And so this is what that kind of looks like here. So uh, one of the tricks that most people don't understand about lighting in photography is um, when everything's lit evenly, it's boring as possible. So uh, if everything, when you go into a room that's a fluorescent lit classroom, everybody in there has the same amount of light on them. Therefore, if you were to kind of think of this like you go to a theater performance, how do you know who the main character is? Most of the time it's cause either they have a spotlight or they relit the stage to draw your attention to that person. But when you go into a classroom and photograph, your eye, I don't care what you do compositionally, you can work at it all you want, but the light saying everything gets the same value. So the easiest way to improve your photography is to add one little light and draw your attention to that one spot. So example here is if I just let the lights on in the back room and just lit it with available light and shot it on a tripod, you wouldn't have your eye going to her face as much. Everything would have the exact same value. And so that's the advantage of lighting is it's directing the audience where you want them to look. Again, uh, 40 degree on one side, 10 degree on the other side, amber gel overall. The amber gel is hitting everything, but because the amber is a little darker than the grid light, the grid lights punch through and that's what's lighting and getting the correct skin color. Same thing here. And it's just a matter of once you set up lights, you can play a composition, you can recompose and other things, but you really have to kind of think what you're trying to accomplish. And that's the lighting for that. Not much different. I just shifted her forward and had her bend over and look at the camera. It always, uh, one of the best things you can probably do for any of your photography is um, I could show you this with somebody just standing there and the difference in your pictures is often the subject matter you pick. 
So the lighting could be all night uh, the same, but just the fact that she's a ballerina and on point, that helps a whole bunch here. But I have a slight grid on her face. If you'll notice, her face is just a hair bit brighter, even though she has on white litards, I'm trying to make her face draw your attention. So that's the brightest on the uh, face. So grid on her, grid from the other side, a blue gel in the background, amber gel in the columns. Traveling with the cows, I do this a lot. So on cow appreciation days, they're all showing up. Well, um, one of the problems, if any of you try to do this, of uh, black and white cows out in the bright sunlight in the middle of the day, it's gonna be very difficult for you to, uh, you may see their eyes a little, the, the ears and the black spots kind of lose detail. So the easiest thing to do is just uh, pop some flash in there and fill it. So with my assistants, all I did was we put uh, my little speed lights on either side. The reason I'm traveling with speed lights is I'm flying somewhere, getting out of plane, going, and it's just running gun. You don't have the ability to carry a lot of gear. So um, in this case, I had voice activated light stands assistants who just held the lights and we could go real quickly. So this is happening. These are not set up like, hey, we're going to go do the cows today and we're gonna take a few hours. That was done within about five minutes and gone on to the next thing. So if you know how to light, know what you're doing, you can do things very quickly. Very different than the first photo with the drummer in setting up in a studio and taking a few hours to do that shot. This is more of, you gotta know what you're doing and move to the next thing. Senior photos, uh, put the guy in the pool and then I just used two strobes on one end of the pool and two on the other. So this is what this lighting, there's some behind him also, but basically this is the, I mean, the sun's behind him, sorry, sun's behind him. And then two strobes at the edge of the pool firing in to kind of light him up. If you do that at that time of day and use the sun as like a rim light or hair light, it's much easier just to kick in some light. Here went around the Roswell Park, nice green background. Actually over, I didn't try to underexpose the background. I want it just a little lighter. And then I took a huge soft box that's being right in front of me over the top of the camera and just pointing straight at her. And that's how simple that was. Well, sort of simple because you're doing senior photos and you got an hour, you got to do a bunch of photos, different scenes. So you don't just set up, do one shot and done, you're walking. And if you don't know your lighting and how to set things up, you don't have time to sit there and say, wait, let me get everything right. Work on your stuff. Hold it. What do you say? One stop under. You got to kind of know what you're doing. And after you've done it a few times, you get really consistent with this. Uh, this is Sydney Rame, who is on The Voice um, and a recording artist here in Atlanta. And we did some pictures of her. I actually did this in my front yard and uh, just used some, I had some people holding these lights because the minute you open umbrellas outside, you can say goodbye to your light usually. So I use uh, soft, uh, sometimes soft boxes, but here I had two people, one person on either light holding the stands in place. And the reason I didn't have them where they could just hold them, I want it to be consistent with the exposures because I'm using manual flash here. This is those habitat humanity kind of builds or volunteers working. So I'm going along and um, I just have a person holding the flash off to the side under the hat. If you do this on a regular basis, baseball players all the time, headshots when I do baseball players, I'll wear the caps, you got to bring the lights down and fire underneath that cap. I don't care what you do because I've done it a thousand times again for 10 years. I pretty much all I used was available light. I'd be burning and dodging forever to get their face to look right because all that would be totally shadow without the light. So what I'm doing is actually fixing my time in Photoshop or Lightroom. I very little time I have to spend doing that. Again, that's the simple. The easiest thing to think of for most off camera flash is 45 degrees. Make a triangle from you to the subject and the flash off to one side, left or right, and nine times out of 10, that's a good place to be. And usually about 45 degrees above the person's head, but if they're wearing a baseball cap, you gotta change that.
And uh, this is shot with a 14 to 24. And if you know anything about 14 to 24 and shooting at 14 to do the shot, he is within a few inches of my face when he's hitting that. And so I'm sitting on the ground and I just had him, a person toss the ball in the air consistently in the same spot and he had to come over and kick it. And then he'd kick it over my head and I just had two strobes going there. Again, traveling real light. You may see my light on the right side down there. And I'm just lighting up that, uh, the building just to, and this is in uh, California. And right at dusk, there's about 20 minutes where everything looks really good. But most of the time, most buildings could use a little light kicked in and uh, fixing in. And also the advantage of flash over any other light is the color temperature is co consistently correct. As you go around the world and you're at the equator and then you go up to the North Pole, that difference, the color temperature actually shifts a little on the sun, but your flash will be consistent. It's one of the most consistent lighting sources. So to kick that in cleans up the colors often, which with all those artificial lights are kind of all over sometimes too. Again, these are just shot with those little flashes. Notice the ISO there, ISO 800. And the reason I did that is if you take the, um, your, I'm finding that uh, for most of your modern cameras now that you can easily shoot with a, anytime you're using a flash that the noise almost disappears because usually the noise is in the shadows and the important, those areas you want to look at. And there's virtually no noise at 800 ISO and it makes my lights be a lot brighter than if I tried to shoot it at 100. Any questions up to now? Yeah, I got, I've got one. You've, you've talked about two or three different kinds of lighting and two of them I don't understand. One is the gels and the other is the grid. Yes. Can you, can you sort of define them somehow? A gel is a colored piece of plastic that's used often in theater. And all they do is take, you take that um, colored uh, plastic, which was real thin or thick, depending on which ones, um, and you put that in front of your flash. The minute you put it in front of your flash, it makes your flash a little darker. Um, and the, I'll say this, but you can go to my website. Uh, I'll show it to you in a minute. Let me be sure I remember to do that. But shooting with gels, and you, if you had a white background, if you're two stops under what uh, versus two stops darker shoot and measuring the light on the background than the subject sitting in front of it, then it will be the exact same color as the gel. If it's on a black background, it needs to be two stops brighter because those are on the opposite ends of the histogram. The grids are basically honeycomb shaped patterns and you can buy them in a 10 degree, a 20 degree, a 30 degree, 40 degree, and they even come other sizes too. And you put those either on front of the little tiny flash, your TT, your, your speed light and a company that makes them that are made out of like real quick plastic, uh, rubber and put on your flash is, um, mad uh, magmod makes them where you can just put them on your flash um, and then if you're going to use them for studio flashes they usually come in seven inch circle size and fit on the seven inch reflectors but what, is, what does the grid accomplish it keeps the light from going everywhere so uh -huh. the one thing you do not want to do in photography like i said with the big classroom if you just light the whole room up, all you've done is increase the value, but you've not directed me as a viewer where you want me to look. And so okay. the grid, um, a lot of people think soft boxes are the way to go. Soft boxes work in some situations, but that's assuming that you're not hitting the background and other things. But if you get spillover and light going everywhere, a lot of people end up with stuff that looks like there's no real you haven't really controlled the light. You've just raised, you just lit everything and you don't want to do that. You really want to draw the eye to where you want the person to look. So okay, if, thank you. You do, if you do lighting correctly, you're almost doing nothing in Lightroom. It's almost very minimal stuff. 
As a matter of fact, if you guys look for Dave Black Photography, he's one of the Nikon ambassadors. Everything on his website is straight out of the camera and never goes through Photoshop. It's all shot JPEG. He does shoot raw and gives that to Sports Illustrated and others, but pretty much there's nothing on his website that's not straight out of the camera. He uses the camera and sets up the custom picture controls to dial in things like sharpness and dynamic range and things like that. I have a question. Uh, yeah. Um, so when you're, are you blending the photos when you say you're underexposing the uh, scene or the background by one stop and you're overexposing the subject by one stop, are you, are you blending to do that? That's all in camera. There's nothing after the fact that's in. Uh, okay. That's what, so you're using the flash to bring up the. Right. Like these cows here, I'm slightly underexposed, not quite mm -hmm. a, a full stop here, but I'm, uh, I'm definitely at this time of day, uh and you take that picture the shadows would be horrendous yeah uh coming straight down as you can see from the sun it's straight over top i'm using the flash to kick in so if you look over back at those cars you get an idea of that dark car what that light looks like as compared to how the cows look but like the uh hula dancer thing the one that looks like it was shot in hawaii where you have that dark background and they're lit that's that's a that's a single shot just, that's all single yeah. shot there's no combining nope everything's done once in camera that's I, fantastic <laughs> see i did this because when i was at georgia tech on staff and all the stuff i was showing you you could not do that in the film days uh because of pin registration and everything else you just didn't do the photoshop we do today yeah. um so everything, pretty much everything I do, I do in camera. The only time I do other things is if I'm trying for real estate is where I'll mix flash and ambient and do, or uh, when I do group shots, I've learned to shoot on a tripod, not because I'm not getting in a camera, but out of 20 people, um, if I shoot multiple shots, I can grab somebody's head in one shot and put it in another one where everybody looks like they're all smiling. So, um, <laughs> In the days of film, the minute you went from one person to the second person to get both expressions looking good in one frame, you had to shoot seven times more pictures just by adding one person. And then today with Photoshop on a tripod, uh, you don't have to do that. You can just grab the head from one and put it in another. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, I was just curious because, um, you know, I was just wondering if it was one shot or using a like, a blending or uh, yeah that's where the confusion gets for there um when people you'll hear a lot of pros talking about blending and stuff but often that's um inanimate objects um and so architecture that's done great deal product photography that's done a great deal but when you start getting into people you really it's going to be harder to get those kind of shots and plus when it comes down to it uh the reason people are hiring me is because their relative with the camera is not going to know, or with a phone, is not going to have lights. They're not going to get the moment, plus good lighting on the face. That's what people are hiring me for. Not just um, not just because I know how to light it. They're also looking for me to get the right moment. And I have a social work background in psychology. I can tell you more stuff about people and anticipating. That's just as important as knowing your lighting and how to do that. Oh, that'd be interesting. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So uh, this is my wife. She's a chaplain for the Roswell Fire Department as well as for St. Joseph's. And uh, she just got her helmet in because in, uh, when I did this and this was just using the this is uh, station one in Roswell, which is downtown Roswell and the bay doors are open, but I just needed a little light to kick in on her. But the problem was when she opened up the door of the fire department, uh, I had to put a light behind her. It's kind of kicking on the um, on the uh, behind her there. And so it looks kind of like this. And I had a, um, a beauty dish on a Godox flash or flash point. 
or newer. They're all the same. It's just uh, different people. This is my daughter down at the, um, has anybody shot down here before? Crog Tunnel? Yeah. Anybody Where's shot that? there? Where is that? It's a beautiful spot. Um, Krog, Krog, Krog Tunnel Krog downtown. Street. Yeah, the Crog Street Tunnel downtown. Every kids love this. And my daughter is a theater major, was at uh, Columbus State and performs and does is in some movies and stuff, but this is where I photographed her down here in the tunnel. So I, uh, the tunnel is lit up. I have one light straight behind her, pointed straight to her head, and then one light in front. And there's these are with seven inch reflectors. There's no umbrellas or anything. And this is my very first photo shoot with my flashpoint lights, which are the 600 TTL flashes. I was just testing them out. And so you can see the two lights there. That's how I set it up. And she's down that tunnel there, you can see. Here she is outside near the Crog Street behind one of the restaurants. And we kind of like that. And all I did was add some lights in front of her and just picked up the logo behind her. And again, that's just one light off to the side. Super simple. So um, this is... Um, for everybody that's here, if you don't go out and use flash um, and uh, you use you just take pictures with your camera, let me just tell you that everybody's phone can do what you do with your camera when it comes to pictures of your family and friends. So if you don't use lights and you don't do anything, the phones do as well as your camera for most headshots and stuff. So you're really not bringing much to the game if all you do is compose and take a picture and well expose it. So um, there's a reason your friends aren't recognizing and saying, please take pictures sometimes. Now, if they're taking, if you're getting asked to take a lot of pictures and you're, and they may just want you to do it because they don't want to deal with it. But the, if you want your pictures to really stand out, my suggestion is just get one light and start from there. Example here, I need a picture of the lady inside the catering uh, vehicle and that they do there at Northridge. You're, you need a flash. You, <laughs> you, you do a picture at that time of day, she would have been in the shade, silhouetted, dark as anything. And I didn't take before and after shots to kind of show all this, but I do have that on my blog. Again, that's at picturestoryteller.com. So I, when I teach my workshop out in Hawaii and I teach lighting and business practices, I take the students out and we do this and it's basically one light in essence to the right. And I'm letting the, you have to time it so you're at the beach at the right time to get the nice sunlight. But most of that's just one light off to the side. Uh, but the problem with that kind of stuff, if you start shooting sunsets and stuff, you have 10 minutes, you set up early, you get everything ready, and then you're kind of waiting for the background to get to the right exposure. Because it's in essence, you're waiting for God to turn down the dimming on the background for you. And you don't want it to be too dark or it won't work. And if it's too bright, it won't work. It has to be just you know the right color to make it work there. So drive through, she's kind of standing out of an awning there and handing out stuff, uh, the bringing this, uh, this was right at the beginning of the pandemic. So I have a friend of mine just holding the, on the other side of that vehicle on the right there that she's handing to, he's up a little bit higher and shooting across and holding that. Um, and it's a, the Flashpoint 600 TTL. And basically, you know, doing that. And I think I have one other flash there as well in the background that I put in here, but that's basically what's happening there. Senior portraits, downtown Decatur, near Five Points area. We just went off to one of the side streets. She wants to, she's down in Austin, Texas now is uh, uh, studying film and uh, wanted something with that. She brought the props. I just kind of put her in this area where it's artistic and that's what she was looking for. One light off to the side, real simple. Again, using that kind of underexposed background just a little and pop the flash in. 
here we are and realize this is in the middle of the day uh more like i think it's around four in the afternoon but it's still the sun's not in the right place if you look at uh it's coming over to my back and i'm trying to pop in a flash and just make it clean up her face a little again just one light off the side the sun's near there but i wanted a different kind of light so it's not like i couldn't put uh, this is where you have you're trying to help out the sun because some of the sh shadows underneath the nose and all I'm cleaning up with a flash. This is one of those real complex lighting things because um, to do laser photos, um, when you go into laser shows like at Stone Mountain, all they put smoke in the air so that the lasers will show up. If you go into a research lab and put smoke anywhere, they're going to shoot you because that gets all over their instruments. So anybody have a guess how I make the laser show up when you can't use smoke or powder? It doesn't exist without something in front of the light. Uh, the... How do you get cool. lasers to show up? You know, when Tom Cruise hangs from the ceiling, they spray stuff to see it. Otherwise, you don't see them. I give up like a mist. <laughs> no, you can't use anything because a mist will get on the sensors. Saran wrap? Hmm. No, I just take a piece of uh, tissue and wrap it. I put a black tape around it, gaffer tape, and then I trace that whole line of it. And as long as I don't keep my hand still, you won't ever see my hand, but it's moving through the photo. And that's about a 30 second exposure. The flash stops the other, and there's nothing left on the. Uh, when I'm done, I have uh, there's no nothing to clean up after I've done my photography. Oh, I get it. Okay, okay, yeah. As long as long as it's a long exposure, and you it move fast be, enough. Yeah, for lasers, you have to be yeah. And that's how I lit that. Okay. So those are all the different kind of pictures there. So uh, one of you was asking about grids. I'm going to take you to that part of my website real quick. Where did it go? Um, so somebody was asking about this uh, grid. And all you have to do is put um, uh, let's see. Let me change that to grids. Let's see if that works better. Right in. Let me do this one. Um, And so when I'm teaching the class out in Hawaii, I take them around and show them this. And then we take some of these here. And these are the grid lights here. And I was hoping to have that. It's not there. Sorry. Thought I'd have the grid in here. Um, so this is available light in a studio. And then using lights, you just take everything down. And that's a grid on that person's face. So it's not lighting. The room looks just like we just like this room here it's all lit up but if i put one grid light which is like a tube of light going to the person it makes a big difference there let me see if i can then so rembrandt lighting creating that and seeing it i have a grid from one side to give a hard light which is kind of oh, like yeah. 20s and then i put a gel behind there and the grid is this little pattern here um and i tell you what i'll just do it this way uh, or somebody was asking what those were. These are the grids. They look like this. Uh huh. Okay. And these pop over the front of your flash. They also make fabric grids that go on front of your soft boxes. And the whole point is to keep the light going where you want it and not spilling over the rest of the photo. What is what is the degree variance 
um, causing the grid. Uh, the... It makes it tighter grid. Uh, a 10 degree means it's just putting a 10 degree round light out in front. So it's like a really ah. fine point. A 40 okay. degree is more like a floodlight. And so, it, okay. and then with no grid, it's really a floodlight. It's, you know. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So, so but, it's, it's I, the, yeah. the uh, spread of the light. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And the whole idea is you don't want the the trick in lighting is you don't want to light everything you want to direct it the, um, the stronger the stuff that really pops and grabs your attention we call that um in theater lighting or things we call it dramatic lighting which is really you're you're not lighting once you light up the whole room it's a little bit too much any other questions so when you travel are you using like a 8200 uh pro that size or just a 600 tt you know i think it's ttl 600s it yeah. depends on the assignment what i'm doing because uh, i saw like the ones you were using for the um like the power those probably aren't good for travel <laughs> those are those are big well i have a the travel kits let me see Um, so like real small stuff, I'll just carry the little speed lights and I put them in my think tanks. Um, and then I have these for, uh, that's for video lighting. Um, then for, this is when I was shooting for TTL with Nikon strobes and I'd carry a flash. I use a mini TTL Z's and then I put the flash on and just carry those. And that was pretty much it, um, a flash. And so, but now with the MagMod system, um, this is like you can do, this is my son out and I just did this to show people how simple it is. This is outside my garage at dust time. And I put, this is that little TTL flash, put a little dome on it, that of the sphere, and then use our background light here and, and use a trifecta lighting kit that I think I uh, think that's Joe McNally's but anyway those are just a real simple two lights and you can do um real quick um headshots for people so are you what kind of reflectors are you using are you using like the uh u-shaped ones or the just a three piece panel this for uh your question would uh to kind of help you I use all kinds of reflectors to answer your question, but for this particular photo, what you're seeing there is those triflect. Uh, and so what it's doing is adding lights underneath and the sides with one light, I'm just kicking back in. It's called clamshell lighting, where the main light is from the front on top, that's butterfly. And if you took those away, you'd have a little shadow under a person's nose, it looks like a butterfly. And that's why they call it butterfly lighting. And clam lighting, it looks just like a clamshell in your camera with the clamshell open. Uh, like this, and then these reflectors are acting like they're lower value than the top light. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Any other questions? So has everybody gotten their R5s and their Z9s and all that? Well, that's a whole different discussion, but no. <laughs> oh, no. Yes. <laughs> so when it comes to things like um, bird photography, uh, a lot of people don't think of this, but when you're shooting stuff outside um, and you can use a little flash to kick in, off on a lights so here there's a flash that just pops and cleans up the thing the lights um i've done this numerous times let me see if uh i've done hummingbirds with a d4 i did that with my 120. so with a flash you can freeze things so those of you who are into nature stuff uh you can use these and i've seen people even take strobes outside in the woods and do wolves and bears and you just have somebody off to the side with you that's you know, you could almost have a light for them, they could have one for you. And whenever they fire, your flash will go and help out kind of kick in a little light um, and clean up the value. So these aren't the best of shots, but that gives you an idea that you can shoot 
um, and you can light the stuff kind of from inside and shoot through a window. Um, the uh, these are some other pictures here doing the exact same thing with the um, and this is the they're not TTL but it's um, the newer which is the same thing as the Godox but you can get those for really cheap and you can zoom and, and point the flash in and control the power from the camera. So um, what I uh, the only thing I was saying is you the reason I was mentioning that is you can use lighting for more than just for um, uh, like portraits and stuff. That's how most people think. But um, let's see if this works. So when I'm doing um, strobes for, uh, when I shoot for Sports Illustrator or something, I'll light the entire arena up with lights in the ceiling. Um, so I was looking for the Coliseum. I don't have that right here, but this is lit here with strobes up in the ceiling. Um, and this is also probably one of the most famous dunks in all of college basketball. The guy kept on going over him and then slammed. It's never really been done before or after in college basketball, but the strobes are while lighting this. There's two in the ceiling on this side and two behind me on the other side. And so when you, you're you lighting this stuff, there's one up there, you can see it firing. And then it makes it easier so that the color is just right. And the, the players don't object to the strobes going off? No, look at the Hawks, my friend, Scott Cunningham and all that. They shoot with those all the time. Now, okay. if you're in a really small gym and you're pointing straight at somebody, it would probably bother them. Volleyball, <laughs> they're less likely to let you use it because they're looking straight up all the time. But for basketball, they're not looking towards the lights. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. But it cleans up everything. It makes the color look a lot better. Do you, does the Z9 have an anti-flicker function? I know the R5 does, because I know certain lights you can run into a flicker problem with them. Yeah, it has nothing to do with the camera when uh, you get a certain kind of lighting. Um, the anti-flicker helps with some, but there's a point where every camera has a problem with some banding and it has nothing to do with the camera, it has everything to do with the lighting you're under. And so if you shoot a little bit slower than say 80th of a second, yeah. Your fluorescent tubes are actually flash tubes. Most people don't know that. They're f flashing 60 times a second, the strobes inside the tubes that you see in Walmarts and all those. So what happens if you shoot faster than a hundredth of a second, you're catching the flash sink and you're actually, that's where you start to see the bands. Yeah. But the Z9. I haven't, I haven't um, tried indoors and tried mine, but they say, the newer ones have an anti-flicker setting that's supposed to help help with that some. It helps a whole bunch. The Z9s that I use, there's they don't have a shutter in them, so um, yeah, they. But it's still a problem under certain kind of lights. You'll still get. It's not like you turn the flick anti-flicker on, and it fixes it for everything. There's a there's certain lights that will still get it. Certain sodium vapor. If you're under those, it just ain't going to work. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just I wondered if you had ran into that shooting like basketball games or if any of those lights caused issues. You'll find that it depends on when the gymnasium was built too. So as the uh, places like um, when they moved from the Georgia Dome over to Mercedes Benz the lighting in there went to daylight balanced before it was fluorescent balanced. And so the color got better color temperature and then it went up about a half a stop. But because the lights they put in, it doesn't have that problem. If you shoot at Agnes Scott, their basketball, that's got some of the best lighting I've seen for any basketball court. Uh, but it's because they have newer kind of lights in there that don't have that problem. Oh, okay. But you can still go to a really different school and it has everything to do with they just didn't they bought cheap lights and put them in and you there's nothing you can do. Because you can't shoot at a 
a hundredth of a second and shoot basketball very well. No. <laughs> Any no. other questions anybody have? Was this helpful for anybody? Was this what you were looking for? Yes. What would I what would you want to see next time if I ever did this for you again that you're missing that you wish I'd done? The psychology part would be nice to hear you were talking about and telling a story with a photo, the psychology portion of that. Oh yeah, that's a whole nother thing. It also works in portrait photography too. I'll tell you our theme next month is tells the story. So yeah. Yeah, and I'll tell you something that you need to know that I'll disagree with a lot of people on this, but you cannot tell a story. A narrative story has to have tension or it's not a storyline. Uh, so uh, that's why weddings are such a story. Every, something goes wrong that day for everybody and it's like, well, we survive the end of the day. Uh, but anyway, uh, story requires that. A single photo cannot really tell a story. It get, you need words with it to give you the missing parts to know what's going on. And you when you put a package of pictures together, that's where you start to fill it out. It's like, okay, here's the person starting to encounter the problem. Here they are going through and you can put together a, a kind of a narrative story arc. But the concept that people say, oh, that picture tells a story. Really, what does it tell you? And the person's, they have to make up what they think. Like that's a mom or a dad and there's ways to do that, but it's very interesting. I hope you have fun working with that next month. Anything else? Anything that you guys missed that I, you wish I'd shown you that would have helped understand the stuff better? So, just a heads up the stuff that I probably in the past have done uh, for a lot of people. Um, if you go to this, it's picturestory.com and then do things like before and after. Uh, some of these will show you kind of like what I did before and after. That's what it looks like. That's what it looks like after I did the picture. So, and then you can see all the strobes set up before, after. Notice there's no grass, it's all non-green. I put in grass, everything here. So that's one of the things. So if you look at some of these before and afters, um, uh, that that helps a whole bunch. Um, and uh, the before and after shots, I have a few of those through my website, but you can go and see examples of with flash, without flash. And I'll post the link to the uh, website um, sometime this weekend, uh, probably when I post the uh, recording of the uh, presentation. That way, if people have questions or want to visit the website, they'll be able to uh, access it. Um, is the website the best way for folks to get in touch with you, or do you have? You can go with my my email address is stanley at stanleyleary.com. So if you come to my main website and just put stanley at in front of the, the website, and here you go to the blog that's there. There's some testimonials and people who, you know, different things to give you some more background about who I am and what I do. And some of the videos there, I've done, I don't know, a few thousand videos for different things. And these are just some samplings of things I do. Everything from uh, just interviews and such. So hopefully that helps. Anyone else have questions? So how many people probably aren't going to do any of this and continue to take pictures of birds and do everything without a flash? <laughs> well, I, for one, I'm going to, I mean, I haven't used flash before, but it sounds like I need to, because I can see some definite ways it could improve things. Yeah, same here. I'm working to use flash more, so. Um, I'm definitely trying to incorporate it more. The one thing I can suggest on anything you pick up in photography is to continue to grow and learn. My suggestion is if you've never, if you've written this off because you just don't see a purpose of it, I can tell you're making a big mistake. You need to try it, learn it. And if you don't use it all the time, that's okay. 
but if you know about it, then when you're stuck in a situation and somebody needs a picture and you're stuck at your office and everybody said, and you said, you like to take pictures, this is your do or die moment. And if you don't know how to use a flash and it's not in your bag, you may be, uh, you may lose, you may just burn yourself <clears throat> with all your colleagues. So be sure you have a flash, know how to use it. You don't have to use it all the time. Are there I, any flash? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Are there any flash kits that you would recommend um, starting out with? Yeah, I uh, for people who are doing um, the real simplest thing to do is looking at either Godox or Flashpoint. They're the same company. And those are, uh, let me see if I can find it. Uh, if you're looking for on-camera flashes, um, kind of the the 600 TTL one, the um, is what I recommend. Uh, I think it's a 650. Now, would you recommend going with on camera or something something off camera? Um, my suggestion is to always have it off camera, but the TTL flash that I'm talking about, the cool thing that's happened within the last five years in flash that's changed everything is the godox the flashpoint they make the ttl flash you can slide onto your camera but you can take that same flash off and talk to it by radio and make it go off camera okay but i can also buy studio flashes and use them too and they all talk and i can use them together so up until five years ago if you owned a canon flash and put it on your camera you had to buy a whole nother system to do studio work. Now you can mix them so that you don't have to buy every, you can still have a flash. You probably want one in your bag just in case. And then you can use the largest studio flash and mix them together. Okay. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. So for the money you can, the Godox flashes are under 150 bucks or so and you can get a TTL little thing for $34. So for under $200, it does what my $600 Nikon flash does. And if it breaks, it's cheaper to replace it than to even get the Nikon, Nikon one fixed. So if you own a Nikon Canon or Pro Photo and you have to get it repaired, let me just tell you, you're gonna spending up to $100 or better to repair any of them. And you can replace these. So people can complain saying they're not built that well. well they are pretty good. I, I don't have any problems with them. And then the larger TTL flash that I recommend, um, the uh, Flashpoint um, is what I use, like, uh, let's see if this is here. This is the Flashpoint here, and you can use it for everything. The, the advantage of the Flashpoint, it's a battery powered kit, and you can also plug it in and it'll work in TT, um, as AC is you're not limited to just keeping it inside most strobes you plug in or studio strobe but this you can go either way so if you want to you need to go shoot a, a destination wedding or shoot some pictures of family at the beach you know you don't have to worry about plugging in so i use this all the time for like uh i do this every year for my family and this is the photo here and I, it's not a great thing, but I take these flashes, put on either side, take a real quick flash picture. Don't have to worry about the time of day. And when you zoom in, you can, they'll fire really good. And, and the light on the face is really good. All right, cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? I don't want to take, I, I don't want to go over my time with you either. You're doing good with time. Can can you say uh, what brand of uh, the flash that one was again? You showed it on the screen where it showed uh, the model number and everything. This is a Flashpoint Explorer 600 HSS TTL. The TTL just means you can quickly use it and don't have to figure it out. Uh, manual flash is how I use them most of the time because TTL, it sends out a pre-flash, then it flashes, which means your battery drains faster but it can do either way um but the flash point is through adorama the exact same flash is called a newer n-e-w-e-e-r you'll see them that way or godox 
but if your Godox dies on you, it's really hard to know where to send it to get fixed. And Adorama supports getting it all repaired for you. And that's advantage of buying it through Adorama. It's exact same, there's no price difference. It's just, if it's something goes wrong, Adorama will make it right. Whereas B and H, everybody else will say, well, you need to go to the manufacturer to get it fixed. Pro photo is the exact same thing as this, except it's more durable and costs like two and a half times more. But those of you who are Nikon shooters, Nikon is partnering with Profoto. They've not partnered with anybody else before with their strobes. So everybody's good on everything so far. Nothing, no questions on anything else. Well, maybe I don't know enough to ask, but. <laughs> what? Oh, you probably do. Oh. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Dick. Uh, I mean, I, I'm going to have to try some of this stuff out. I'm sure I'll have questions as I go through, but right now, it, I think I understand where I need to start, I guess. There is tons of videos on YouTube how to do this. You buy the flash. Then you, um, you, you can go to YouTube and look at these and go, I have a Canon, whatever, or you pick the camera, put in the flash name, and then there'll be somebody out there showing you exactly how to do anything you want to do on YouTube. And you don't have to worry. You can watch those a thousand times. That's how I learned how to fly my drone. Watch other people crash instead of me. Thanks, Stan. Stanley. Yes, DeBerry. Yeah, I wanted to thank you for your presentation and everything and looking forward to seeing you next Friday with some of the group. And uh, I had heard that a long time ago about the minus one plus one down at the racetrack where I was asking uh, Rusty, Jared, about uh, the minus one plus one. He said, yeah, if you want to darken the sky, but you want to light your subject, you just do a minus one plus one. And when I saw your picture, it reminded me of what Rusty was talking about many years ago. Yeah, and you kind of have to experiment. Sometimes I've gone as many as three stops under to get a really blue, dark sky. Mm -hmm. You'll see that um, Greg Foster would do that all the time. And um, that's what Patrick Murphy Racy does and a few other, all my friends, we do the same thing. So it was just a good way of, uh, when you're doing driver's inter introduction and around the cars and everything, you want the blue sky in the background and all the signage and all that, just dial in a minus one or a minus two and do a plus one or two up above with your flash and it just turns out real well. Yeah, get you in the ballpark really close to what you need and it's mm -hmm. a good place to start. And then you can tweak and go, I don't like that and try something different. Mm -hmm. But again, thank you for your presentation and see you next Friday. Yeah, if you guys ever have cameras break, talk to Barry. He's repaired, I don't know how many of my cameras. Okay. He's replaced my screens on the back of my D4s, I think it was, two of them, and he's replaced. He's also complains that I don't keep my cameras clean whenever he looks at them, so. Uh, but but the, big, the biggest thing for Stanley is, is here he has his Z9 for two weeks. Oh, don't tell me. <laughs> and then he slips down, and then I start getting photographs. What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? I said, take a close up of the scrap lug because I need to see it. So here he does this micro photo of it. And it was nothing more than a top cover that he had, needs to get replaced. So he sent it in. We knew exactly what part he needed. They didn't even have parts supply for it, but somehow Stanley got a little bit of pull, a little bit. And um, big mic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He was able to uh, get it taken care of and everything and back in working order before the Chick-fil-A bowl. So. Yeah, I got some good shots for that. Mm -hmm. So I hope you guys are all having fun. What are you guys taking pictures of in the group? What do you guys take pictures of? 
we have a wide variety of, pe- uh, um, of photographers. We have a lot of, I'd say probably most people are landscape photographers, a lot of bird and nature photographers. We got some portrait photographers. Um, everybody in the group knows what I shoot, which is mostly uh, car shows. That's and we got cool. people. We got people doing real estate and architecture, and you name it. Mike started doing uh, models too, Stanley. Oh, cool! So, typically portrait and street. Well, lucky if you live in the United States and not in Europe, they don't let you do street photography in some of the countries there. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's Germany, is it? I forgot which country. There's two or three of them there that you can't take people's pictures without their permission. That's right. Mm-hmm. Germany has. I think the Netherlands is that way. Yeah. What? That's do you ever them. shoot with proms, or are you mostly always using uh, Zoom when you're doing portraits? When I'm doing portraits, I'm always with primes. If I'm doing, I do an 8518. Uh, and then if I'm doing group shots, I'm with a 24 to 105 because I'm not sure they'll turn around and ask for a quick headshot. So I have to be ready to go between the things. So it depends on what I'm doing. My preference and one of the sharpest lenses that Nikon made was that 8518. And then the, um, the there's so many things out. When I did the picture of the girl that I mentioned, Sydney Rame, who was on um, The Voice, I did that with a 300 to eight. So that was a pretty long lens. So it depends. I, I may back up. It depends on what I'm trying to do. But primes, um, the best way to describe how I think of primes is if I know what I'm going to shoot and that's all I'm going to shoot and I know for sure, I'm probably going to be carrying a 35 millimeter 1.4 and an 85.18. Yeah. But or if, if I'm out doing birding and all that, I'm at 600s and all that kind of stuff. But if I'm going to an event type stuff and I've got to cover an event, I don't know what I'm going to be doing. So I'm shooting with a 28 to 300, which on the new mirrorless camera is a lot sharper. I didn't realize how sharp that lens could be. But the zooms look a lot sharper now on the mirrorless than they ever did on DSLRs. Have you tried the 28 to 70? Well, I guess you shoot Canon. No. 28 to 70. Ooh. Well, I have picked up all the brand new glass that everybody's coming up with, the PF the 800, the 500, and Canon's got the same thing. My friend, um, he shoots sports with me, but he shoots a Canon, and he came out with a 400 2.8 that when I picked it up, I was like, oh my goodness. I almost threw the camera through the ceiling because I was expecting to go up with it. <laughs> and he handed it to me, and I started going up real quick, and it caught me off guard because oh, it was wow. so light. Uh, the camera weighed more than the lens. Oh, wow. That's <laughs> amazing. So, Luckily, I, we didn't call Barry after that, so I didn't drop it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I get phone calls from Stanley, let me tell you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you need to get a repair guy if you every once in a while. I don't try to do that, but I've walked down a hall and smacked the front end of my 24 to 105, and Barry goes, I don't know now. He got it fixed, though. You're, you're, Barry's always going, well, let me see. And then it's always, I don't know now. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that. I've heard that before. Um. So my recommendations, I hope this was helpful. My thing is you need to just practice using flashlights even for nature, doing dusk and lighting and painting and all that's kind of fun. So learn to use light, make it look good. And that's all I was hoping that you guys would at least try to learn a little about it and add that to your uh, quiver so that you have one more thing that you can do rather than the same old one without it. But I'll tell you this much. I tell this to every student that I teach photography. If you ever want to do this professionally and you don't know how to use lights, uh, why would they hire you when they can shoot it on their phone? It looks the same. Uh, There's, I mean, the new phones, they have the telephoto lens, they have four lenses in them all. That's incredible what they can do. So I recommend learn lighting so that you can say you actually know how to write with light. And that's what photography is all about, writing with light. So thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you so much. I think you gave us a Thank lot to think about, a lot to learn. Thank you very much.
we appreciate you coming and uh, we'll visit your website and uh, we're going to do our monthly challenge here in a minute. And if you want to hang out, um, you can take a look and see what people shot this month. Okay. And let me stop sharing and so you can do that. All right. Oh, Bugs and, Bunny. And Lisa, we'll go ahead. Lisa runs the, uh, the uh, monthly challenge now. So I'll let you go ahead and you should be able to share your screen, Lisa. All right, I think I'm sharing. Can everybody see my screen? We can see you and your screen. Yep. All right, now just so I can see my buttons to move the slides. Um, I'm gonna try to start. All right. I don't see my buttons yet, but maybe they'll show up. Um, our photo challenge this month is macro or close up photos. Um, and like Stanley mentioned, next month in May, we're uh, having a topic called Tells a Story. So um, that's a pretty wide open topic. Um, hopefully, we get lots of creative ideas um, as far as telling a story with one picture. And let's see if I can advance my slide. Hmm. There we go. So if you're new to the club, our photo challenge every month is for um, members to submit one image. Uh, we submit single image photos for this challenge, no composites. You must be a paid member to submit and be at the meeting. We do allow one miss a year. We know everybody has something that comes up every now and then. Uh, and then we give points uh, for the top five uh, places each month. Uh, and those points are added up so that we have a photographer of the year uh, by December. And that photographer of the year wins $100, a special trophy and a membership for the following year. Uh, so when we go through our 13 photos tonight, um, you'll want to vote for your favorite three photos, first, second, and third place. Um, don't vote for the same photo twice and be sure to vote for three. Sometimes I have people that just vote for one or two. Take advantage and vote for your favorite three. Um, remember to think about our theme when we go through the photos. Again, it's macro or close up. And I will remind you of this uh, email address at the end as well, but we'll be emailing votes tonight to vote at ngaphoto.club. And we'll go ahead and get started. I usually go through the photos three times so you have plenty of opportunity to see the photos and write down your favorites. Again, vote for first, second, and third place. Photo number one. And if I go too fast or there's a delay, sometimes we have a delay when we're on Zoom, somebody speak up and let me know and I can slow down. Number two. Number three. Four. Five, six, seven, eight. Nine, ten, <laughs> eleven, twelve.
13. And going backwards, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, Six, five, four, three, two, one. One more time, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Okay, so it is 8.37. So by nine o'clock, please send your votes for first, second, and third place to the email address vote at ngaphoto.club. And turning it back over to you, Mike. All right. I think I got two slides left. There we go. All right, our next meeting is going to be May 20th at 7 p.m. We will be back at the Bowen. Uh, we will do a hybrid show or a hybrid presentation, or you can call the show if you want. Um, so folks who can't make it to the Bowen will still be able to watch on Zoom. I make no guarantees of what technical issues we will have next month compared to what we had the first month. Uh, but hopefully we'll be able to do some uh, test meetings before then. Our uh, presentation is going to be uh, John Seibel. A lot of you know him. He's talked to us in the past. Um, his uh, presentation is going to be putting the wild back in your wildlife photography. And our photo challenge theme next month is tell us a story. And that's it. So um, uh, a reminder, if you want to be participate in the um, shootout and um, you haven't already registered, uh, please uh, message me or contact me by uh, Monday uh, where we can fill you in on everything. And that's it. Thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you, uh, Stanley. And uh, we'll see you all next month. See you later, Mike. And have a great night, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.